Hey again, everyone, and welcome to the Experience Maker Show. This is Dan Gingis, customer experience speaker and coach, and I am so excited to have you here today to join me as we talk to a really interesting and impressive couple that is going to talk to us about marketing, customer experience, and a new project that they are working on. Super excited to introduce you to the founders of Barefoot Wine, the number one wine brand in the United States, the best-selling authors of The Barefoot Spirit, and the founders of a new venture that we're gonna talk about called Business Audio Theater, Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. How are you guys? Well, we are fantastic, Dan. Happy to be here. Yeah, great to be with you, Dan. Well, super excited to have you here. Um, for those that don't know, we recently highlighted uh, something from Business Audio Theater on my podcast called Experience This. We're gonna actually play it for you in a little bit as a sample, but some really, really fun stuff that you guys have been working on. Let's start at the beginning and just, you know, we only have a half an hour, but but in a, in a couple minutes, uh, tell me a little bit about your guys' background. And I know that you sort of stumbled into the wine business. You didn't like, you weren't born into the family or you didn't grow up thinking that you were going to go into the wine business. So how did all that come about? Well, it was kind of crazy. We fell into the wine vat backwards. We were both business consultants here in Sonoma County wine country in Northern California. And I had a client, uh, I was helping him to organize his office and such. He was a grape grower. And in a short time, I realized that he hadn't been paid for his grapes for three years. So um, to make a long story short, I sent Michael over there to collect the funds. <laughs> he was my new boyfriend at the time. So I said, go and collect three years worth of grapes harvest. Okay, Michael? And so all I could get out of the deal was to trade goods and services instead of money. Which was $300,000 that was owed him. Yeah, worth of wow. wine and bottling services. So, you know, I came back with the wine and the bottling services contract. And I said, oh, it looks like we've got this figured out, you know. <laughs> Uh, all we have to do is is get a marketing program, come up with a label, you know, uh, learn all the laws, learn about distribution, learn about the supermarkets and the big box stores. How hard could that be? And how long did it take? Yeah, piece of cake, right? Ignorance is bliss, yep. Dan. <laughs> so that, that's how Barefoot gets started. It gets started by converting a debt into goods and services. I love it. So I want to come back to this story because that brand is so interesting. But because of where you stopped your story, it's a perfect time to introduce what you're doing now because of the clip that we're about to share. So yes. fast forward through a whole bunch of years, you've been very successful. You've moved on to, to different things now. And now you're working in, of course, because this is the natural follow on to the wine business is the audiobook business. So <laughs> yeah. talk a little bit about what's going on with that. Well, you know, in California, we have three industries. We got wine, we got software, and we got Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. So we just kind of put them all together, right? <laughs> and so we have a group in Hollywood that actually acts out the parts of the characters in a book or a play, if you will, to, to demonstrate and to convey a business story. So it's a different way of conveying a business story. Now, we wrote our book, the Barefoot Spirit, it's a New York Times bestseller. We turned it into an audio book, which you'll hear. And uh, you know, your colleague Ryan uh, is our partner on that. And so here we are now uh, offering that as a service to founders who want to create a customer experience and an employee experience and a vendor experience by entertaining them with their own true story. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason why I absolutely loved this concept uh, and why we featured it on the podcast was because, and we did it under uh, a, a, a type of segment on our podcast that we call Required Remarkable. And the idea behind that is that there are many required parts of your business that generally end up boring and they don't have to be. Think about things like contracts or billing or invoices. And we sort of looked at it as, the audiobook is kind of one of those things that the author has to do, and it's generally not particularly exciting. And you guys have taken this required part of 
we'll call it required part of being an author and completely turned it on its side. That's uh, right. And, and, and how, uh, so, so tell me how that goes down. How does it, how do you even think about telling a business story like a, a novel or a mystery? Well, Michael and I were both speakers and we wanted to encourage entrepreneurs with our story because we started with no money and no knowledge of our industry and became one of the most popular wines in the nation. So with that experience, we wanted to share with others and we were talking at universities that teach entrepreneurship. And we started noticing that a lot of the students would be coming in with earbuds. So we asked them what they were listening to. They were listening to self-improvement tapes. We said, in order to reach more of our audience to share our experiences with them, we're going to have to take our book, The Barefoot Spirit, and put it in audiobook form. So that's, and whatever we do is fun, Dan. If it's not fun, we don't do it. So we had to make it fun and the book is fun. And by having Hollywood actors play the different parts, it really livens it up with music, sound effects. Uh, it's just like the 1940s radio show. <laughs> well, I love the concept of having fun. I think that's such an important yeah. part of uh, not just being in business, but showing up to work every day. You know, I've been <laughs> yeah. making a joke to people since I went off on my own that uh, I like working for the Dan better than I liked working for the man. And part of it is I get to have fun every day. I get to do what yeah. I love doing. Yeah. And it really is, it's it's so refreshing compared to, uh, you know, I talk to people who say, you know, well, my day today was I sat in 12 consecutive Zoom meetings. And I'm like, oh, it sounds just horrible. That can't be fun. <laughs> You know, yeah. you're, you're probably right about that. So we're going to play a quick clip right now. And this is from the audio book of The Barefoot Spirit, uh, which is Michael and Bonnie's book. And the scene here is actually right about where you stopped your story, uh, <laughs> which is you trying to convince somebody that your whole wine idea is a, is a really good idea and that they should buy your wine. Yeah, who I am, what do you want? We bottled the wine and want you to see it. This is what you asked for. There aren't any leaps or hills or rivers. It's a label she can read from four feet away. The logo is the same as the name. It's in plain English and easy to pronounce. It's a name she'll remember and a logo she won't forget. So, Don, how many truckloads do you want? Are you crazy? I can't buy this. Nobody knows this brand. Nobody's ever seen or heard of Barefoot. It's everything you asked for. Yeah, so what? That doesn't matter. No one's gonna buy something they never heard of. You gotta advertise it. If you're willing to spend $1 million on TV ads, I'll buy it from you. We don't have that kind of advertising budget. Then you gotta go make a name for yourself. You gotta go sell it to every mom and pop store in every corner till everyone knows what Barefoot is. That'll take years. Well, Hulan, you better get started. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, I love that he calls you Houlihan, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, he plays the part of uh, one of the largest supermarket buyers in California. And uh, it's it's being played by uh, Ed Asner, the Ed Asner. So, you know, and he's just as snarky as the real guy was. So he's a perfect fit. But by witnessing that scene, you get the idea, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you do all these things that are right, you do everything you're told, but no, you still have another problem to face, right? Which is how are you gonna get the word out there, see? And so many people start businesses and they love it and they think it's cool and they got a great logo, but they haven't given any thought to market access or advertising. And so that's what that's the lesson in that scene, but it's a whole lot nicer to listen to that than somebody giving you, here's the three things to do, the two things to not do, the three things your customer wants from you. You, you fall asleep with that approach. But Absolutely. you will remember the story and the principle behind the story. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such a fun, I mean, I love the music, the the suspense. It, I mean, it really feels like you, you know, you could be listening to a Sherlock Holmes mystery instead of a business book, uh, which is totally fun. So let's go back then to this part now in your story, because the thing that I wanted to ask you about was, you know, all right, you've got all these uh, hurdles that you have to get over in order to start this company. 
we know the end of the story is it becomes the number one brand in the U.S. There's obviously a lot in the middle, but I but to me the one of the seemingly one of the keys to success was that you made wine accessible to a wider variety of people. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and uh, and you know the 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 concept of being different and of being of of looking to zig where everybody else is zagging. Well, we had to be different because there were so many wines out there. It looked like a pizza. So how are you going to stand out and be different in that realm? It's, it's difficult. Um, we found out that the most wine was purchased in California at the supermarkets by a female buyer. So with that information, we went out to see what the female buyer was buying. She's buying staples for her family for the week. So we had to give her something that had consistent flavor, that had a label that she could remember. She could pronounce every word on the label, plain English, and it would jump, the label would jump right off the shelf. It also had to be a good price and an excellent wine. So that was kind of our parameters that we were starting with. And a lot of that information came from that first buyer played by Ed Asner. He told us what, was uh, a space that could use another product in the market. The market is so full of products. How do you try to shove another one in there? He said there was room in the big bottle, the 1.5 liter section. So we took all of those ideas and put it in a big bottle. And that was a big part of our success. All those, all those things that I just told you about. <laughs> I love it. I probably should have mentioned earlier that I, I wore my wine colored shirt specifically I for you guys that. today. So yeah, I wanted to dress the part. Spill, if you spill a little, nobody will know. No one will notice, exactly. Um, so I love a couple of things that you said because you know some of what you were talking about was branding, obviously the label jumping off the shelf. But I love that you also talked about writing in plain English. We, we had a, uh, a guest on a couple of weeks ago uh, from a company that actually studies readability and helps companies look at their marketing and figure out how to simplify the language so that more people understand it. And I think mm -hmm. it's such a key uh, part of the buying process that we often see companies that are using, you know, techno jargon or industry terms, buzzwords, acronyms, mm -hmm. things that just confuse people. Uh, and I love the simplicity of, of the brand, which I think it does play such a big role. Yes, absolutely. And because it was simple, it related to a lot of people that weren't drinking wine at the time. So, <clears throat> pardon. So it opened up the door to wine, to our wine, with the beer drinkers. You see? Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they say, well, I can't pronounce the varietal. I don't know what kind of wine goes with what food. You know, they're very intimidated by wine. I know I was when we started. I wasn't even yep. a wine drinker when we got into the wine industry. Amazing. It is, it, it, it can be intimidating for sure. Um, I uh, actually spent a little time in my early life as a bartender. And, and so I came to appreciate uh, some of these things. And it is intimidating, especially if you're just starting out. Um, and, you know, you, you, you know the basic difference between red and white and then your knowledge ends there. Um, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So uh, I think that's really interesting. And then the other thing you pointed out that I wanted to come back to was you talked about listening to your customer and, and really identifying who she was. Can you talk a little bit more about how you got into that person's head? And then when you designed what you did, how did you know that it was working besides from sales? Did you, I assume that you continued to talk to your customers? Well, we started out like most businesses start out. We, we focused on our customer and we tried to create a customer experience that we thought that would please them. And we even got a lot of feedback. But where we made our big mistake was we thought we only had one customer, the end user. Right. We didn't realize that we had to go through our own employees to get to distributor owners to get to distributor sales managers, to get to sales managers, salespersons, to get to store owners, to get to clerks, to get to our customer. So that's, that's seven line. steps. That's, that's seven. Seven, seven steps. Seven sales. Now, each one of these people wanted something different. 
You know, like if you if you go in and start preaching to a distributor about your features and benefits, when what they really want to know is what is the strategic value of me carrying your brand in this city? You know, hey, I'm in L.A., right? So I want to know how are you going to make my company more important in L.A.? And I don't care about wine. I don't care about features and benefits or price. I just want to know how you're going to make my company more important in L.A. And so after years of not realizing that that's what the customer really wanted or that that was even the customer, we finally figured it out. And we would say, okay, we've got an approval here from the largest supermarket in L.A. and they want you to carry it. See, a whole different approach. They didn't even care what we were selling. No, yeah, no. In <laughs> fact, the only person that cared what we were selling was the ultimate customer. The end user. Everybody yeah. else had a different agenda. But imagine how hard it was for us to, you know, try to get our product to our ultimate customer without realizing all those steps and all those requirements that everybody between us and them had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is true of uh, most B2B companies today. And and you guys were sort of B2B to B2B to B2B to C. Exactly. <laughs> so there are a lot of Bs in there, but I think most B2Bs uh, forget this, that there are different, there are various people in the middle. Um, yep. And I often get asked when I speak about customer experience, if there's B2B people in the audience, they'll, they'll come up afterwards and say, hey, you know, love the presentation, but does this even apply to B2Bs? <laughs> And yeah. my answer, which I'll admit is a little sarcastic, is, well, it, all, it depends whether you are actually marketing to humans or not. And I just stop. <laughs> and they're like, well, of course I am. I said, well, you know, because, and this is true in, in any business, right? Those distributors, those people in the middle, they're consumers in their other lives as well. Yeah. And so we can use what we know in B2C to talk to them. But great point that they all, you know, we have to understand each person's uh, needs and expectations and, and try to do something about them. So what led you guys then to say, hey, we want to go into the audiobook business? Like, I get that you had your own best-selling book, but where did that idea even come from? Well, the book came from our staff, really, and other business associates, because we had a company that was so unique. And because we started without money and then without knowledge of our industry, we learned a lot. And our staff didn't turn over for the last seven years. So we had excellent company culture. And the number one hidden cost in any company budget is turnover. And it is hidden. So um, that was a big part of it. So the other thing that I would like to add to that is that we became speakers. You know, it became a New York <laughs> Times bestseller. So we became speakers and we've spoken from Singapore to Moscow on entrepreneurship. And um, in the process, we, we started to fall in love with our audience, which was really let's say 24 to 44 years old, that were people that were out there either thinking about going to business or they had just gone into business or they wanted to grow their business. And we realized we had a lot to offer them, mostly experience. A lot of it was bad experience that we could keep them, you know, from suffering through like we did. And so we, we began to think about how can we become more efficient at reaching this audience? And like Bonnie says, when we started to notice that people were falling in love with podcasts and audiobooks, we said, this is an avenue to the 24 through 44 year old because it is mobile. They're not, you know, they're not limited to a screen. Uh, they're not limited to a book. You know, they can be driving, jogging, whatever, and they can be educated at the same time. And, so, and entertained. And we also have clients who are business clients, and we started to realize that they could benefit from it too. And especially when COVID hit, we started to realize that when they were sending everybody home to work from home, how are you going to maintain company culture at home? How, how are you going to make that person want to work for your specific company? And how are you going to attract people to your company if they don't know who you are, what you stand for, you know, if you're not really transparent about your principles? So these days, especially with the younger crowd, 
it's really important that they work for a company that they're proud of. You know, they're proud of the way they treat their people. They're proud of the way that they treat their environment. They're they're proud of the way they treat their customers. So where does that pride come from? We think it comes from an engaging story where the founder is kind of the hero and they identify, but the founder isn't born with a spoon in his mouth. You know, it goes through just hell and high water. And it's like every chapter is like a cliffhanger. You know, will he make it or will she make it? And so... It, it's engaging, and we thought this is a this is a really great way to teach and convey business. And we're business people, so like I said, business Hollywood, and then we got the technology MP3 technology. You got you got all three of them. I love it. That's uh, that's fantastic. Well, it's such an interesting um, concept. I think you're right that that COVID has even made it more popular. Uh, I, I joined the ranks of the people who got dogs during COVID, so now I'm walking a lot more. And, right. uh, and what do I have? I got my AirPods on, and I'm always listening to a podcast or an audio book or something. Uh, and and certainly uh, a lot of them leave to leave uh, something to be desired in terms of the entertainment factor. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we wanted to get away from that, you know, patronizing, you know, top down. Here's how I did it. Here's how smart I am. Here's what you should do. I'm telling you, these are the three things. When you start talking like that to people, it kind of turns them off. But when sure. you say, hey, listen, we started in a garage and we were bankrupt and we were getting our butts kicked and boom, there's a knock at the door. It's a bill collector. Oh, the telephone rings. It's our best buyer. He's talking about leaving us. What are we going to do, right? That's more like the real world. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, so we only have a couple minutes left. I'm interested um, in in your guys' thoughts. Um, obviously, 2020 has been a year for <laughs> for the record books in so many different ways. Uh, everything has changed. Customer experience, I think uh, the good news is, has really come to the forefront and, and companies that maybe weren't spending as much time on it have realized that it's absolutely critical to success. So what do you guys see coming up in 2021? What do you think we have to look forward to in terms of branding or marketing or customer experience, whatever the, the worlds that you're traveling in? It'll be more of what we've seen changed within the last couple of years, which is the consumer is looking deeper into the companies that they purchase from. So uh, as a shopper, I take my, my checkbook, my credit card, I go to the store, I dash through the store buying my brands, okay? Now, right now, my brands have got to support the environment. They've got to be good guys. Um, I support local farmers for my produce because they're in my community and they're supporting the community and helping support my lifestyle by being here and keeping the neighborhoods uh, fed with local food. This is really important to me. So whatever the shopper is spending their money on, they want to know where that money's going. They want to know that it's going to improve the earth or working conditions and not the other way around. I think that trend is going to be even more stronger in the future. Well, sure. You know, when you start to see that we are now looking at the majority of the buyers are going to be under 40 years old. That's going to change things. Now they're going, oh, wait a minute, am I buying products from a company that's going to screw up the world for my kids and for my life? Or am I buying uh, products from a company that uses child labor or that, uh, that uh, disrespects women? You know, or, or worse, do I want to work for a company? You know, so now, so marketing in the future is more about who you are as a producer and what you stand for and less about your products, features and benefits. So I think that that's how things are gonna change in the future. People are voting with their bucks. Yes, we always have, but now we're more aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. I, you know, I like to frame it as uh, the competing on price generally is a loser's game. It's tough to compete <laughs> on price, uh, and competing on product is tough because so much has become commoditized. And so, whatever's left is the experience. And I think you guys make a great point that the experience is more than just how I consume your product or service. 
but it's really about what does your company stand for and what do, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of desire from millennials and younger of companies taking a stand on social issues mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe one side or the other, right? But just taking a stand. Yes. Uh, and I think that's part of what the, the future of branding is that the company stand, you know, stands for its products, but it also stands for something bigger than that. Um, Michael Bonnie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I always say this is the fastest half an hour on the internet. I could, I feel like I could talk to you for hours more. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time. Really, uh, I, I feel honored and uh, and uh, great to learn from you, and, and certainly great to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. Pleasure to be with you, Dan. Thank you. And best of luck for continued success down the road. Uh, that is going to be a wrap for a, another episode of Experience Maker. Uh, next week, I welcome, actually, I think this is the first time that I am welcoming somebody that I have not met before um, or even communicated with before. So I'm super excited. Uh, Jason S. Bradshaw, he is the Chief Customer Officer and Chief Marketing Officer of Volkswagen Group Australia. So we're gonna bring a little Australian accent to uh, the party next week. Looking forward, I've heard, uh, he knows a lot of people that I know. We have a lot of people, friends in common but we've never met and I'm super excited to learn from him. Uh, he seems like a great guy. I again am Dan Gingis. I'm a customer experience speaker and coach. I really appreciate you joining me today and every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Experience Maker Show. Have a great rest of the week and a terrific weekend. Stay safe out there. Hey everyone, it's Dan Gingis again. As a special gift to listeners and viewers of the Experience Maker Show, we're happy to offer you a free chapter to The Barefoot Spirit, the book that Michael and Bonnie just talked with you about, about the founders of Barefoot Wine. That audiobook is filled with music and drama and actors and amazing scenes, even though it's a business book and it is so much fun to listen to. So if you'd like your free chapter, go to thebarefootspirit.com slash free chapter and enjoy this gift for listeners and viewers of The Experience Maker Show.